Advent. May the peace and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be known to you as we worship. My hope this Advent season is that we will become aware of the presence of Christ now as we wait for a new revelation at Christmas. Welcome to First Christian Church Disciples of Christ of Covington, Kentucky. We are so glad you joined us today. If you are joining us for the first time, please visit our website, firstchristiancovington.org, to learn more about us and get our latest news. on the second week of Advent, we call upon you as the God of peace made flesh in Jesus Christ, the bringer of peace into our world. Oh, how we long for peace, God. We sing songs about peace on earth. We consistently pray for peace. Each week we pass the peace to one another during worship. We long for your peaceable kingdom to reign over all the earth when wars will cease and violence rooted in hate and fear will be no more. We long for peace in our country where our differences are celebrated and our gifts used to bring about unity and oneness and wholeness. 
We long for peace within our homes and relationships that are strained by the uncertainty of unemployment and the lasting effects of this pandemic where patience runs thin and tempers flare. We long for inner peace as we struggle to balance the demands on our lives. We are deeply saddened that we cannot be together in worship during this time of Advent, heartbroken at the number of loved ones sick and dying that we cannot be with, frustrated and even angry at the lack of empathy and compassion some are exhibiting. God, you see that we long for peace. We need peace. But we recognize the peace we long for and need can only come from you. We boldly pray for your spirit of peace to enter our hearts, transforming us from within to be instruments of peace in the world around us. As our restlessness and uncertainty looms, remind us to pause and to breathe in your spirit of peace, peace which passes all understanding, centering us, grounding us in your love and grace. In our waiting, may your love and peace consume us as we seek to follow in your ways, walking in your peace filled and peaceful light. In the name of the one who sustains us and journeys with us, we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. John testifies to all who received Christ, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. The Apostle Paul wrote to the saints of Ephesus that Christ has made known to us the mystery of his will. We light this candle as a sign of the mysteries of our faith, that we may trust that even when we feel alone, we are a part of God's family.
Our first scripture reading comes from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which it enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Our second scripture reading comes from Romans 5, chapter 12 through 19. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift of grace of the one man Jesus Christ abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. <clears throat> Today we read John's version of the Christmas story. There are no innkeepers, mangers, barn animals, young mothers, angels, shepherds, or wise men. There is only light and life, grace and truth. Specifically, John tells the Christmas story in two of these 16 verses. He says in John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The second comes at verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. These two verses give us the Christian belief known as the incarnation, which is the belief that God became a human. The second century theologian and first significant theologian after the apostles was Saint Irenaeus, the Bishop of Gaul. Irenaeus believed that the incarnation alone is what saves us. The cross and the res resurrection are important to him, but not salvific. He believed that God saved humanity when God became a human. The incarnation was especially significant to the writer of the Gospel of John, 
because the goal of this gospel was to prove that Jesus was the incarnation of God. There were a group of believers known as Gnostics. They believed that Jesus was a man. They believed Christ was a divine spirit that settled upon Jesus at his baptism and left him before the crucifixion. The Gnostics didn't believe that the Christ was born or suffered. Irenaeus wrote a lot about the Incarnation, specifically about this scripture from John chapter 1 in a book called Against Heresies. These verses were included in John's Gospel to disprove the beliefs of the Gnostics. Against Heresies took John chapter 1 as Irenaeus's basis for proving that the Gnostics weren't true Christians. Christians believe that Jesus was the Christ, both 100% God and 100% human, who was born, lived, suffered, died, and was bodily resurrected. Irenaeus writes that Jesus, according to the first chapter of the Gospel of John, is Christ, the only begotten, by whom all things were made, was the Son of God, the true light who enlightened every man, the creator of the world, the one that came to his own, that became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning of it all, Genesis starts with a poetic account of God's ordering the primordial chaotic nothingness into all the wonder and glory of the world. It is God's spoken word that brings order from chaos and beauty from nothing. Just a few paragraphs later, the story turns to a division in the relationship between God and the created beings as sin blemishes the unity of God and humans. God's word, the same word that was spoken and created all things, has now taken on flesh according to the Gospel of John. The Word of God has taken on human form, setting right the relationship between God and humanity and creating a new relationship where God and humanity intersect. Darkness and light had been at odds from the time of Adam and Eve to Christ. Irenaeus refers to the writings of the Apostle Paul to make his theological claim about the reconciliation of God to humanity through the Incarnation. He cites Paul's letter to the Romans. Just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, so one man, Christ's, act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. Sin entered this world by a man, and so must be overcome by a human. The grace of God entered into this world and dwelt among us, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. The Word made flesh, God living the full human experience from birth to death, joy and pain, crying and laughing, loving and hurting. God created everything good, and God loved it so much that God was willing to do everything possible to save it. God was so willing to save us that God got down on the ground, hands dirty, knee deep in sin close to us. This was John's Christmas story. John tells me that God was made flesh and dwelt among us so that we could be adopted as children of God and receive grace upon grace. The incarnation is the most important tenet in my faith in Jesus Christ. He was born for our salvation. God was born to walk among us and live like we live. He knows the pain, suffering, and sorrow of the human experience. Jesus knew what it was like to want relationships. Most of his friends didn't understand him until after he died. His friends didn't understand what he was saying most of the time. He wept over the loss of a friend. His friends failed him in the garden when he needed their most. His friends abandoned him when he faced his greatest trial. And many of his friends weren't there when he died. He may not know failed marriages or addiction or mental health illness or cancer, 
But Jesus knows what it's like to have friends and family fail you. He knows loneliness. He has faced demons and he has celebrated with friends. He has experienced this life and knows both the joy and sorrow of our human existence. For me, God's grace was born on Christmas Day. John's Christmas story says that the word made flesh is both light and life for all. The world did not understand the light because it lived in darkness. The people rejected the light and did not welcome him. But there were some who did come to recognize the light. For those of us that understand the light, we are made children of God. Jesus has other authorized us who welcome the light to become children of God. By our faith in and our understanding of Jesus, we have been adopted. This is significant because John says as much about our adoption as children of God as he says about Jesus' incarnation. Accepting the light is the beginning of our new relationship with God, who became one of us. That means, as children of God, the light is central to our relationship with God. John tells us that the light is full of grace and truth. The word grace only appears in the Gospels in these verses of John's Gospel. Grace and truth came into being when Jesus the Christ was born. In Jesus, we all have received grace upon grace. God was made flesh and dwelt among us so that we could be adopted as children. Reverend Nadia Bowles Weber has a lot to say about grace. She is a Lutheran pastor, and grace is central to the Lutheran theology. I've introduced you to her works before. I'd like to share with you a quote from her memoir about her time in pastoral leadership. In her work book, she writes a lot about grace. I think she sums up grace really well, so I'll share with you what she has to say. She swears a lot in her book, so I've cleaned up the language. I probably said that the last time I quoted her. She writes, God's grace is not defined as grace being forgiving to us when, even though we have sinned. Grace is when God is a source of wholeness, which makes up for my failings. My failings hurt me and others and even the planet. And God's grace to me is that my brokenness is not the final word. My selfishness is not the end all. Instead, it's that God makes beautiful things out of even my stuff. Grace isn't about God creating humans as flawed beings and then acting all hurt when we inevitably fail, and then stepping in like the hero to grant us grace, like saying, oh, it's okay, I'll be a good guy and forgive you. It's God saying, I love the world too much to let your sin define you and be the final word. As children of God, accepting the light, we are defined by the light, not the darkness. It's a tricky thing to say we are defined by the light and not the darkness, or grace and not sin, because we are both sinner and saint, much like a recovering alcoholic is a sober drunk. We may live in the light, but the darkness is always there. John, though says that the darkness doesn't extinguish or overcome the light. As a preacher, I find it difficult to remind us both of our sin and grace. I may tend to focus on grace too much because I read so many Lutherans who write so much about grace. In the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, he says that all have sinned and fall short of God's glory but all are treated as righteous, freely by his grace. We must recognize our sin and our sainthood to live most fully as a child of God. It can be easy to allow sin to define us and our faith journey. It is a constant struggle to allow ourselves to be defined by grace, not sin. It is easier to focus on our past, our mistakes, and our failures. That is the power of darkness. It is difficult to focus on our triumphs. We are so willing to allow ourselves to be defined by this or that rather than the truth. We can regret the past, but not live in it. 
we can learn from our mistakes and not make them again. Both the good and the bad are part of our past. What is our present and future is the transformative power of God to cover it all in grace. From Jesus, his life, full of grace and truth. From him we have received grace upon grace. John writes that there is grace upon grace. There is so much grace that grace covers and layers upon grace. God was made flesh and dwelt among us so that we may receive grace upon grace. During this Advent season, we are both waiting for grace to be born and receiving grace in abundance. As we journey through this season, pause to experience moments of grace. Savor God's presence and let there be a moment of peace. And then enjoy, in, enjoy the sight of beautiful Christmas lights. Sit and watch the snow fall. Laugh with your family on FaceTime. Fold some fresh out of the dryer warm laundry. Bake some goodies or prepare a special meal. Read a good book. Enjoy a quiet evening with your family. Save for the sights, scents, and feels of the season. Those are more moments of grace that surround you in God's love and remind you that you are a beloved child of God who has sinned but is covered in grace. Amen. Kentucky Disciples, I'm Dean Phelps, your Transitional Regional Minister. When I think about Advent hymns, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus is always one of the first that comes to mind. Charles Wesley's text brings together beautifully both our hope in Christ's return and our joy at Christ risen and present among us. Jesus, the joy of every longing heart. As we experience the Advent journey to the manger, we have an opportunity to reflect on the ministry that we have shared as the Christian Church in Kentucky. We have an opportunity to, to think on the ministries that have gone before, that have prepared us for the ministry that we share today. As we listen to a little bit of Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, I hope you will enjoy these reflections on our ministry as the Kentucky region. Come thou long expected Jesus born to set thy people free from our fears and sins. 
Jesus, let us find our rest in Thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth Thou art, Since the revival at Cane Ridge, whether we have called ourselves Christians or disciples, we have shared ministry together. We have built on ministry in the past so that we might sustain ministry in the future. We have made a difference in the lives of individuals and in communities all across Kentucky. Your gift to the Christmas offering helps to ensure that the ministries we have built and that we carry out today will continue well into the future making a difference in these places that we call home. This table has a special significance for us, and it is an important place. But it's more than just a place. It is a symbol of our recognition of Christ's sacrifice as a community. It is a symbol of our recognition that this sacrifice was for all people, and that all are welcome at the table. So as we come to this table in spirit, in this time of isolation, let this table renew and revitalize our community and our welcome. For Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray for the communion. Holy God, whose peace surrounds and comforts us, we thank you for your offer of that peace in Christ's sacrifice. And in this season of Advent, we recall again the word spoken to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. And as we bless this communion, let us know the peace within that is the sure fruit of your divine presence and help us to become peacemakers as we are nourished by these elements. We pray this in your Son's name. May the peace of Christ be with you.
May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you throughout this season and be born anew on Christmas. Thank you.